when we look at the 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 demand for kidney uh, transplantation today, what percentage of it is chronic versus acute kidney failure? Yeah, so the the vast majority is chronic. So there there are um, occasions where patients can get acute renal injury from you know uh, traumatic events, uh, other medical catastrophes, or they get acute kidney injury in the chronic in this case of sepsis or something that they otherwise recover from. Um, and that that does, um, you know, we still see, and we still see occasionally patients who get, for example, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or other diseases that are more linked to kind of an acute event. The vast majority of kidney transplants though, in the United States, the, the primary indication is diabetes or hypertension. So this is chronic kidney disease um, as a consequence of those comorbid conditions which is one of the reasons, again, from a public health standpoint, the, the impact of kidney transplantation is massive. You know, So you have 100,000 people roughly waiting for a kidney transplant in the United States. You probably have fourfold that or thereabout on dialysis, hmm. and then probably tenfold that number with chronic kidney disease. So the, the potential impact of, of having an effective and durable therapy for chronic kidney disease is is remarkable, um, and I think is is really important to consider as a as a you know public health problem. Yeah, I I, I, can't, I can't agree with you more, Chris. And about three years ago, I sort of had this obvious epiphany. I say obvious because I'm sort of thinking, why did it take me so long to do the math? But I realized if if my interest clinically is trying to figure out how to help people live longer and live better you got to start thinking about what are the things that you have to plan for. So if you're flying a glider where you know you want to cross a 200 foot chasm, but now all of a sudden you say, well, I want that chasm to be 300 feet. You have to start thinking about how much higher does that glider, glider need to fly. And one of the things that really occurred to me was kidney function. We sort of have in the back of our minds, eh, you know, look, if a person reaches the finish line of life and their glomerular filtration rate is 40, great. You know, they don't need dialysis, they're doing just fine. And if we think that an average life expectancy should be 71 or something, and we think that, hey, we're gonna tolerate a person's GFR being in the low 40s when they're in their early 70s, that's great. But if we're trying to figure out a way to help people live and live well into their 90s or beyond, that's, that becomes a very unacceptable GFR. You're going to run into yeah. trouble. And so, you know, looking at cystatin C beyond just creatinine and other biomarkers and looking at microalbumin in the urine twice a year, I mean, we do all these things, but even though they seem kind of crazy, because it's how you sort of start to catch that early, yeah. early, oh, look, you know what? Your blood pressure of 130 over 85 is not really acceptable. That's, that's, that's gonna take you from a GFR of 95 to 85 in the next decade. And we consider that to be too precipitous a decline. Um, so unfortunately, my view is that I think the demand for kidneys is only going to go up as we see yeah. the rampant explosion of prediabetes and metabolic syndrome. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think, and there's so many kind of wrinkles to that question to think about. I mean, the first is that is the obvious statement that as as you preach better than anybody, we don't do preventative care, you know, <laughs> in in this country very well. And 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 we particularly don't do it for things where we don't have reliable measures. You know, so so to your point, you know, we we use serum creatinine as kind of our best guess at kidney function. There's lots of reasons why that's a poor indicator. Um, you know, it, it's it's not it's very dependent on muscle mass and and other variables that that um, allow you, that prevent you from using some sort of kind of normalized number as a acceptable range uh, there are more sensitive markers as you alluded to there there's now I think fortunately finally being recognized the whole question of how creatinine and GFR and race interacts and how that needs to be accommodated for so so you're right. So number one, we don't measure it well, so therefore we don't appreciate the size of the problem. Number two is we, again, this is kind of a situation where transplant is a victim of its own success. You know, as transplantation has gotten more successful, 
transplant centers around the country, transplant providers, and, and just the medical community in general has started to say, well, you know, why don't we provide kidney transplants for 70 year olds if they're otherwise, you know, uh, healthy individuals? Because their life expectancy might be 20 years from that point. So, um, and that's, that I think, the, the collision of that and then the what you alluded to, this pre-diabetes metabolic syndrome, you know, um, progressive kidney dysfunction in an aging population is going to create an enormous demand for kidney transplantation. Um, you know, we we uh, transplanted an 81 year old a, a few weeks ago, and I remember as I was looking at the the uh, census, I, I don't do kidney transplant very commonly as part of my clinical practice. So I was looking at the census, I was like, wait a minute, is that? Is, is this gentleman 10 years out from a transplant back in the hospital for some other reason, or did we actually transplant this 81 year? But the point is there are individuals who are healthy, functional mm -hmm. people otherwise, who have a, whose life, you know, part of what we're talking about is survival benefit, right? You compare their survival on dialysis to their survival with the transplant. Transplant is gonna win almost every time, um, you know, as long as they you know, can tolerate the operation, the immunosuppression. So, so it is an, it, it is an kind of remarkable to think of the scope of that problem and particularly to take a longevity lens on it. You know, it's, it's really kind of an interesting um, challenge to think about for the next, you know, 20, 30 years of transplantation. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.